Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel all about real estate. My name is Lewis and in today's video, we're going to be talking about how to qualify for a mortgage. Specifically, we're going to talk about the four C's of qualifying for a mortgage. So if you are interested in purchasing a home, purchasing a, an investment property, or even if you're out there trying to refinance, but you don't quite understand how the mortgage process works, well, we are gonna walk you through that process step-by-step step here today. So by the end of this video, you're gonna know exactly what you need to get in order in order to qualify for that home loan. And before we get started, if I could ask a small favor, if you are new to the channel and you like all things finance, real estate, and investing, please consider hitting that like button and tapping that subscribe button to see more weekly videos just like this. Let's go. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. We have an article from Freddie Mac. It is called The Four C's of Qualifying for a Mortgage. Now, whether you're a first time home buyer or you are re-entering the housing market, the process to qualify for a mortgage can be a little intimidating, but if you know what lenders are looking for, you can be a little bit more confident in your ability to actually secure that mortgage. So we're, we're gonna go over the four C's specifically here, but then I am also gonna break them down in plain English so that you understand exactly what is going on. So the first, C is capacity. And this is referring to your ability to pay back the loan. So in the general sense, they just want to review your income and your ability to continue to pay that mortgage back month after month for the years to come. After all, it is a 30 year loan. So what do they look at specifically? So lenders are going to want to verify your income. They're going to take a look at the source of income, whether you're um, working a W-2 job, whether you are self-employed, do you receive a salary? Are you commissioned? They're going to look at how long you have been receiving this income. And then they're going to look at if that income is expected to continue here in the future. And they are also going to be looking at whatever shows up on your credit report. Things like credit cards, car payments, student loans, um, personal loans, you know, child support, alimony, and other debts that you may be required to pay. And the idea here is they want to establish what's called a debt to income ratio. And so they will take a look at how much you earn on a monthly basis. And then they're going to take a look at what you have outgoing in expenses. And then they're going to express that debt to income ratio as a percentage. Lenders are looking for a 45% debt to income ratio or less. Now, there are circumstances where you can have a higher DTI ratio, um, but in the general sense, 45% or less is what they're looking for. That includes the subject property that you are financing, as well as any additional monthly obligations that you're required to pay. So let me give you an example. If you are a W-2 wage earner earning, let's say, $10,000 per month, a 45% debt to income ratio would mean that you cannot have monthly expenses that exceed $4,500 on a monthly basis, 45% of $10,000 per month. So that would include your housing expenses. That would also include any credit cards, car payments, student loans, things that show up on your credit report. Now, some of the things that are not included in that figure are things like utilities, cell phone payments, you know, uh, car insurance, things like that. That is excluded from that ratio altogether. Primarily, they're just looking at things that show up on your credit report. Now, it's also important to add that with regards to income, lenders are generally looking for a two-year history. So if you're self-employed, they want to see two years worth of tax returns. And then they'll want to see a year-to-date profit and loss statement that supports the income that is reflected on your tax returns. If you are a W-2 wage earner, they're generally going to want to see a two-year history in the same line of work. So if you've been with the same employer for a couple years, piece of cake, you get two years worth of W-2s and you provide the most recent 30 days worth of pay stubs. No problem. Now, there are circumstances where maybe you only need to show one year's worth of tax returns or maybe you only need to show one year's worth of w-2s but in general they want to see a two-year history with regards to your capacity and your ability to repay so two years is the target and if you're setting yourself up to purchase a home in the next couple years 
That is ultimately what the lenders are looking for. All right, the second C is capital. And what lenders are referring to with capital is the amount of funds available for down payment and closing costs in order to get into that property. So what the lender is gonna look for here in this case, they're gonna to wanna to review any asset accounts that you have or specifically the ones that you intend to use um, uh, for the purchase of that property. So they're gonna look at things like your checking account, your savings account, your investment accounts. Um, are you gonna be receiving any gift funds from family members? And they, they will ultimately want to see minimum two months worth of those asset statements. And what an underwriter is gonna look for is how long those funds have been in the accounts. Are there any large deposits that seem out of place? If so, they will need to be sourced. And the idea here is they just wanna make sure that you have the funds available to cover the down payment and closing costs for the purchase of that home. The third C is collateral. And this one is relatively simple because the collateral is the home that you are purchasing. So lenders consider the value of the property and any other possessions that you're pledging as security against the loan. Now, in the case of a mortgage, the collateral is the actual home itself. And to determine the fair market value of that property, the lender will have an appraisal done. If the home that you are purchasing, let's say you're under contract for 500,000, and then the appraised value comes back in at 500,000, then the lender feels secure in that the value is there in the event that you do not pay your mortgage. If you were to go delinquent on your mortgage, the lender has the ability after a certain amount of time to go through the foreclosure process and then take that property back. A good analogy would be like a car loan. So when you're purchasing a, a vehicle, let's say the vehicle is $10,000 and you put $1,000 down and you finance the other $9,000. Well, in the event that you do not make those payments, then the bank has the ability to go back, take the vehicle back because they know that it's worth at least $9,000 or $10,000 and then they can resell that vehicle and then recapture the amount that they owe. Now, generally speaking, the more equity you have in the home, the less risk there is for the lender. So, so what happens a lot of times is if you're putting a larger amount of money down, so let's say 20% or 25% or 30% down, then pricing on your interest rate tends to get slightly better because the lender assumes less risk. They know that if you stop making the payments, they can take back the property and they're likely going to still have equity in that home. All right, the fourth and final C is a big one. It is credit. Credit is very important. So generally speaking, the higher the credit score that you have, the better the rate and the terms. So let me give you an idea of what lenders are looking for and how they structure their loan level pricing adjustments. For most lenders, if your middle credit score is over 740, you're gonna get access to some of the best rates and the best terms that these lenders have available. Once the credit score goes below 720, we will take an additional loan level pricing adjustment. Pricing gets slightly worse. And then it gets slightly worse again under 700 and then slightly worse again under 680. Some of these lenders actually have minimum credit score requirements for different programs. So you're gonna have to talk to a mortgage broker or a mortgage professional and get the exact details so that you know exactly what you're looking for. Think of credit like a report card from back in you know high school or grade school. It's basically a track record of your history of paying bills. So they are gonna be looking at you know how long you've had credit established, have you paid your payments on time? You know, has anything gone delinquent and things like that? This is a really big one. And there's a few things that you can do to make sure that your credit score is in tip top shape. One is make sure that everything is paid on time. And then there's, um, there's a factor that that these credit companies look at called credit utilization. And the way the credit utilization works is that let's say you have a $10,000 limit on your credit card. Well, if you carry a $9,000 balance, you're at 90% credit utilization. To improve your scores, you wanna make sure that credit utilization is at 30% or less. So in that example, you'd wanna have less than a $3,000 balance that will increase your scores. Um, but the main thing that they're looking for is timely payments, low levels of debt, low credit utilization. And if you do those things consistently over time, your credit score will, will be really, really good. And that's what the lenders are looking for. But the idea here is that even if you're not looking at purchasing within the next year or two, you certainly wanna work 
to improve your credit score, get it up as high as you possibly can so that you can get access to some of the best rates and the best pricing when you choose to move forward on a home purchase. All right, so let's recap the four C's real quick. We have capacity. That is your income and your ability to repay. Lenders are looking for a two-year history and they want to see a debt-to-income ratio, in most cases, at 45% or less. Then, of course, they're going to be looking at capital, and that is the amount that you have set aside for down payment and closing costs. Now, the products vary depending on your credit situation and how much you're looking to put down. But generally speaking, if you're a first time home buyer and credit is excellent, you could do as little as 3% down, but more commonly, they're looking at things like 5% down or higher, plus the closing costs. The third C is collateral, which is the lender looking at the actual home that you are buying where the mortgage will be tied to. They're mostly concerned with the fair market value in this case. They will do an appraisal. As long as the appraisal comes in where you need it to and there's no major health or safety issues that are reflected in that appraisal report, then the collateral should be fine. And then of course the fourth C is credit. Lenders are gonna be looking at a credit report to assess the record of which you have paid your bills and other debts on time. And then as I mentioned previously, the, the higher the score, the better the rate in terms that you will ultimately secure when you go out to get a mortgage. All right, so that is going to wrap it up for today's video. I hope you found value in this information. Leave your comments and questions below. Oh, and if you haven't done so already, please consider liking and subscribing to see more weekly videos on finance, real estate, and investing. Thank you again. Take care.